All right, everybody. How's everybody doing? Y'all good? All right, now listen, listen. One of the things that always happens to me, um, I'm on the road a lot, uh, I have no life. All right, let's just call it what it is. So whenever I leave America and I come out to Asia and Europe, all these other countries, once I start doing my thing, I get up on stage, I start talking to people, I notice, how do I politely say this? People who aren't American are too damn nice. <laughs> see, listen, listen, listen. I'm real casual. I think you can kind of see that, right? So I'm going to kind of do some stuff, and I want you to kind of be real casual with me. So I need you to kind of just relax a little bit. Everybody do this with your shoulders. Go ahead. People, I'm serious. Do it. Yeah, go ahead. There you go. Loosen up a little bit. There you go. Now, I'm going to do my thing up here. And when I'm doing my thing, I want you to kind of get involved with me. I got a wireless access point, got a couple of uh, vulnerable apps I'm gonna mess with, I got an IDS I'm gonna let you mess with. And um, last year I did my thing and I was drinking on stage. And then they came back and they gave me all the critiques. And they're like, hey Joe, um, your critique was that your presentation was okay, but you didn't do enough demos. So now my whole presentation is all demos. <laughs> okay? so. I want to see what the hell you asked for next year. <laughs> All right, guys, so pen testing high security environments. Uh, I've been beating down networks for a good 10 years or so. Uh, networks have sucked for years, and they still suck. I don't know if any of you have experienced that, but networks still suck. Applications still suck. But what's happened now is now we have 50 million security products protecting our applications that what? There you go. So networks what? Applications, but we bought a whole bunch of stuff that protects all this stuff that, that's it. So that's how this is going to work for us today. So who am I? I'm a network guy. Most people know me. I'm the black guy at security conferences. Yes, that's me. I always go into this, right? Everyone, you're the, um, that, uh, uh, the Afro colored, uh, um, uh, uh, I've seen you before. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's me. Okay? All right, guys, I've been doing this for a while, like I said, and what I do, I hack, I curse, and of course, anybody who knows me knows what do I drink? Rum and Coke. Rum and Coke. Okay? Now, there's been some changes in my life. Got a new girlfriend. <sighs> so now she gets so mad because I drink too much. She really doesn't like how I eat. That's why I have to travel. That's why I had to come here. So I had to eat all this goulash, get all this food with a lot of fat. That's what I'm talking about, man. So please don't tell her that I'm eating and drinking. All right, guys. Uh, like I said, I've been doing this for a minute. Check out the CRT monitors. Anybody remember those? Okay, so that was my first DEF CON, and I got a lot of people who've been talking to me about doing Capture the Flags, um, and for me, Capture the Flag was just a, an amazing experience. It was just absolutely wonderful. Changed my life like Jesus, man. You know what I'm saying? Like straight hallelujah, this is it. So what I want to do is I wanted to create a Capture the Flag exercise for beginners. So if you're new, you probably never competed in a Capture the Flag. Uh, we're hosting one. It's a month-long training class to prepare you for it. The Capture the Flag is going to have encryption, uh, encoding challenges, uh, network challenges, malware challenges, reverse engineering challenges, exploit dev challenges, all kinds of stuff. Big, massive competition, uh, so we can just have a whole lot of fun. So uh, just kind of shameless plug for what I got going on, and now let's do the damn thing, yeah? All right, I got a wireless network set up. Please do not break my poor little cheesy wireless AP. Okay, so if you want to jump on the network, it's Joe Hacktivity uh, Demo. There's the password for it. I've got this text file. And the reason for the text file is it'll allow you to copy and paste. Now, normally when I do this, I let people do all this like Windows 7 stuff and all that, but uh, all you're going to need is just a web browser. So if you have Firefox, Chrome, whatever, you want to crack open your iPad or crack open your laptop, jump on this network. Uh, I've got an IDS. I've got a snort box running. 
Um, and we're just going to kind of keep it light. So we're just going to do a bunch of web app stuff, a bunch of SQL injection, a bunch of cross-site scripting against this host that's got a web app. And then we've got another um, box that's got a web application firewall configured. So I'll walk you through some IDS bypass and some web application firewall bypass. And we'll just kind of get in there and let's just talk about it. And we'll do the thing. Y'all cool with that? Okay, everybody, nod your head. All right, cool. Okay, do I need to hold this up a little bit longer or can I get started? You need a minute? Well, hurry up, man, damn. Did you see how long Shaq took when he was talking? I had like two bowls of goulash back there while Shaq was talking, man. See how long Shaq ran? All right. All right, let's do this. Okay, so we've got ourselves our handy dandy intrusion detection system. And we've got this text file. Let me start. Let me start zoom it. Okay, so if you want to check out the text file, here's the text file. Okay. Now, what I'm going to go through is just some real trivial SQL injection cross-site scripting. And if you want to mess with an app that's a little bit tougher, um, you can check this text file. And there's two apps. So 2.6. 2.6 is an ASP.NET app that has request validate running. It's got an um, uh, updated version of the .NET framework with the anti-cross-site scripting library and a couple of other security mechanisms and a modified web.config file for other security libraries to be loaded. 2.7 is the same app, but it's got all of those .NET security features and the web application firewall. So I'm going to mess with this app, 2.35. And I'm going to kind of talk about that. So if you're already familiar with basic cross-site scripting and basic SQL injection, why don't you play with 2.6 and uh, uh, 2.5 and 2.7 while I do this one. All right, guys. So we got our text file. We can copy and paste because that's what life is all about. All right. So I've got this. Now, the first thing we want to talk about is parameter passing. So we've got bookdetail.aspx. The question mark signifies parameter passing. ID equals two. So basically what's happening is your web server front end is talking to your database back end. Your web server is like, hey, database. Psst. Yo, man, come here. What I need to do is I need to know if you've got this record that corresponds with ID and its value is two. Database is like, yeah, too easy, man. I got that. Here you go. So. What we want to do is we want to test to see if there's SQL injection. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw in a simple quote like that. And then, oh, beg on me, Pargon. Bam. Undisclosed question mark after the character string, right? All from throwing in a single quote. Now, this is the most common types of test, right? You're going to replace the parameter value with a quote or you're going to directly append to the parameter value with a quote, right? This is what you see all the time. No big deal. Here's a couple of other ones that may interest you. OK, so I suck at math, but that is a four. Everybody with me? Everybody nod your head. Yes, that's a four, Joe. All right, cool. Now, something that might interest you. If you notice that when I change this to a two, ID equals two, the page changes. When I change it to a four, ID equals four, the page changes. Now, I'm going to put in parentheses a two, and I get the same page as the two without parentheses. Now, if I do four minus two, I get two, page two. If I do four minus one, the page changes to the same page as ID equals three. You guys notice that? So, how many of you have run into these cases where you're doing a penetration test, you're messing with the website, you go, okay, I put in a tick, it automatically redirects me to the homepage. 
I try to do some sort of SQL injection and it redirects me to the same page or redirects me to the home page, right? What they've done is they've suppressed error messages. So I'm not seeing my ODBC error message that makes me do the happy dance because I got SQL injection, right? I, I see something's wrong, but I can't figure out what. So what's happened is your developer thinks he's smart, right? And we run into this, come on, don't, don't, don't act like it's just me. Right, you run into a developer or you run into a sysadmin who's like, well, I'll just turn off error messages, okay? But what's really happening is you've got the database to execute arithmetic functions. So if the database is executing arithmetic functions like this, four minus one, and you're seeing that I get page three, we've just proved that SQL injection is now possible. So now you can go right back to the customer. You can be like, no, 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 no. Pump the brakes, boy. You still have SQL injection. What happened was, you probably knew that you had SQL injection, and you tried to do some ghetto little fix, right? And this is common. We run into these Band-Aids and this stuff all the time. So these are the types of tricks that I've had to use. Now, the game's changed because a lot of people now use things like web application firewalls. So when you're trying to do your normal select statement, you know, your, uh, like a real common one, you might do something like this, right? So you might say, let me go two or one in select user like this, right? So this is pretty common and we can see that the app is running as DBO, right? Here's our select user statement. Well, the web application firewall is probably gonna trap on that select statement, right? No, 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 can't do selects, right? So when you see stuff like that, you probably go, okay, well, man, I haven't figured out if I'm up against the web application firewall or not. Doing these arithmetic tricks are good ways to figure out if you have SQL injection and there's a web application firewall in front of you. Now, I had the horrible, excuse me, horrible misfortune of doing a lot of retail chain pen testing. Okay, now anybody tell me what's that mean in English? Retail chain pen testing. There's a compliance regulation I'm getting at. Come on. PCI. Oh, bullshit. God, I hate PCI. <laughs> so, I'm doing retail pen testing all the time. Now, the PCI council in their infinite wisdom says, thou shall, thou will, use secure coding standards in accordance with OWASP secure coding, secure coding guidance. You will do this. Or you can deploy a web application firewall. <laughs> so, every customer that I had what would they do? Now, would they do the right thing like what Shaquille was talking about and do all this threat modeling and you know, get in there and let's have a meeting after another meeting after another meeting and eventually fix it? No, what did they do? Right, they back in the truck up, beep, 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 beep. They got the WAF, they run down into the rack, slide that bad boy into the rack, we're fixed. So, as soon as you start to see these types of things, that's when some of these other uh, in my opinion, interesting things kind of come into play. Let's see. Let's say, let's say everything I've done so far, would you say that we've identified SQL injection? And I'll go like this. I'll do a or one and select DB name. And we can see that the first database is called book app. Now if I change this zero to a one, Next database is called what? Okay, change the database number to a two. Next database is called what? Okay, now, help me here. Would you say we've identified SQL injection? Yeah, now that's great. That's great. The problem is my IDS has no red. That thing, it's got no red. No, we're doing SQL injection, right? Okay, well, hold on. I, I must be doing something wrong. I didn't just get database information directly from the database and this thing tell me what? Right? No, 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 wait a minute, wait, no, 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 hold on, hold on. Okay, wait, 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 let me try that again. How about I try something else? How about I go, okay, well let's try 
instead of database enumeration, let's go for some table enumeration. Okay. So select top one name from sys objects where x type equals char 85. And that first table name is? Okay, now I'm thinking that's SQL injection. Who's with me? Stevie Wonder can see that that's SQL injection, right? We know that's SQL injection, but, um, mm, mm. You, you know what? It's a cheap system. It's a cheap system. There's a little mistake. The rules aren't updated. The IDS rules are a little old. I uploaded them this morning. They're a little old. They're a little old. So I, I, maybe I messed up somewhere and I didn't upload the latest rules. The rules are about three hours old. I don't know. Okay. Well, let's see. What if we try and ask for, hey, database. Okay, man, let's try this again. There we go. Man, you know, you'd think that after this many years, I'd be able to copy and paste. I'm serious, you would think that I would know how to do that, but obviously, I'm experiencing technical difficulties. <laughs> Copying and pasting. All right, I think I got it. Huh? Oh, man, really? Okay, so our second database table is called what? Okay, and all we did was we said, hey, Instead of sys objects where um, x type char equals 85, where that told us it was bookmaster, we said, hey, can you give me the name of the table that's what? Greater than bookmaster? In other words, dude, if, this, if bookmaster is this table, can you tell me the table of the one that's like right next to you? Right, and this is how we do database enumeration, right? So as soon as you extract the database name, and the table name, now once you get your table names, you just keep asking, hey man, can I have the table name that's greater than the one I'm looking at right now? And we just keep doing that until we run out of table names, right? So that's not too hard. I think I can handle that. And, hmm. Problem? Okay. Well, what if I tried a union-based SQL injection? Now, there's a couple of different types of SQL injection, and we just did error-based SQL injection. So I'm gonna try another type called union-based SQL injection. So what do I do with the union? I say, hey, man. I say, can I order by 100? Now, think about it like this. Let's say you have a spreadsheet. So you have a spreadsheet, and you got these columns. Now, if I have 10 columns, can I order by five? people, can I? Yeah, okay, now if I have 10 columns, can I order by 20? No, because what? No, oh, thanks, man. I don't, I don't have 20 columns, right? So what it's gonna tell you is, hey, man, what you're asking for is what? Out of range, man, I don't have that many columns. So what you can do is you can say, all right, I'm gonna order by 100, he says, dude, you don't have that many, so I'll order by 50, then he tells me what? You ain't got that many either. So, all right, let me, let me try and order by 25. Yeah, order by 25. Yeah. Nope, don't have that. Uh, how about a, um, give me a, come on. Huh? 12? 13? 13's unlucky. Okay, I ordered by 13. Mm, no 13. Nine. Okay, so I ordered by nine. Ooh, valid record. So I have more than nine, but less than, right? And you just keep playing the game, right? You kind of do that. Do I have this many, not that many? Right, until you figure out how many columns are in the table. So once we figure out how many columns are in the table, I'm gonna guess that we have nine, right? So now what we do is we build out what's called a union statement. So with this union select statement, what you're doing is you're gonna say, okay, like this. The union statement joins the statement that the developer wrote with a statement of your own.
but you have to have the correct number of columns for both statements combined for the union to work. That's the reason that we do the order by. So when you're doing this SQL injection and you see it, you're gonna do the order by to figure out the correct number of columns, then you're gonna stick in your union all select, and then you're gonna have each of these numbers from one to however many columns you have to figure out where your placeholders are gonna be. Now once we do that, we need to negate this record right here. So two, we need to negate it. I'm either gonna change it to a negative number or the word null. So I'm gonna put in a negative number and now, my screen gets funny. Check that out. I got a seven, a two, a three, a four. These are the columns that echo back data. So now, in each one of those, guys, give me a number. One that's on the screen. Okay? All right, um, let's go with two. So now, I'll take two, I'll go to the placeholder two, and I'll say user, whoops. That. And now, where the two was, the user shows up. Make sense? So, what if I go for the three? So, maybe at the three, I'll do at at version, like that. And now, what shows up? Starting to see what's going on? Now, help me, guys. Would you say that we have SQL injection? <laughs> Starting to see what I'm getting at? So I know this is kind of messed up, right? And again, I started my security career as an IDS analyst, and it was a horrible life. You know, to have to look at packet captures all damn day, nothing maybe other than marriage will make you want to put a bullet in your head. I mean, I was just like, this is bad. All day of looking at this stuff, man, I'm like that. It was bad. So when you start seeing this stuff, the stuff that gets by is just mind-boggling, flat-out mind-boggling. So let's say, let's say we want to do some interesting stuff. Maybe, maybe I want to grab, let's go from here all the way to here. So, I'm getting the version, database version, the server name, and this mass, master sys function var bend a hex string what? Nothing important, right? <laughs> okay? All right. Now, I'm thinking that's a helpful thing to have. Anybody? Okay, now, the important thing is we need to know that our IDS is a great thing to have. <laughs> Who's with me? Let's run out and let's buy one of the, you know what? Let's not get an IDS, let's get a SIM product. How about a SIM solution? Wouldn't that be even better? That way we can correlate all of our useless logs that we don't look at. <laughs> That'll be awesome. So, okay, let's say we do something interesting. All right, now, we've got some of these things like this, right? We've got a one equals one, we've got a one equals two, and then we've got a one times one. Okay, so everybody with me, one equals one? Yeah. Okay, does one equal two? No, it doesn't, right? But what you're trying to do is you're trying to see if there's changes in the page that you can enumerate. So let's say I'm doing this. I get a valid page here. If I change this to a two, does the page change? If the page changes from some, some discernible way, then programmatically I can figure out Okay, this is called inference-based SQL injection. So if I can do this one equals one and this one equals two, now I can start to figure out, okay, uh, is the username DBO and one equals one? Because if you have the and statement, if the username is DBO and the one equals one and I get the correct page, then I know the user is DBO. Does that make sense? So that's what inference-based SQL injection is. 
Now, who's liking that IDS? It's an awesome product. Okay. Now, sometimes you might do some other stuff like this. Okay, what do you notice I have here, guys? One is what? Greater than negative one. So in a lot of these cases, or my favorite one that I really like, okay, again, it's, it's all these different ways of asking the same question, right? Who has children? Anybody kids? Kids? Yeah, if you have kids, you've experienced this in your life. You've said, no, you can't have that. So your kid's like, oh, well, well, well can, I, can I have this? <laughs> no, you can't have any cookies. Well, well, how about the Chips Ahoy? No, you can't have cookies. Okay, but, but what about the Oreos? No, you can't have any, you know, see. I've been through this, I'm just saying. I've been through it. Okay. All right, now, here's another one that we run into. So in this case, let's say that the database wouldn't throw any error messages. We've got this one here. It's called a wait for delay. This is called time-based blind SQL injection. So what you're doing here is you're saying wait for delay 10 seconds. Now what you'll notice is that thing is what? Waiting. And then after 10 seconds, you get a valid page. So if you can do that, you can say, hey, you know what, database, let me ask you a couple of questions. You can say something like, if the user is Joe, what? Wait 10 seconds. Make sense? If the user's DBO, wait 10 seconds. Okay? So these blind SQL injection methods are things that you can do when developers try to patch things instead of fixing them, okay? So now you notice, hey, it waited, so that actually is SQL injection. So let's try something a little bit more interesting. Here we go. So I'm grabbing this one. I'm trying that. Okay, now it's red. <laughs> Let's look at it. Let's look at it. Okay, hold on. What happened? XP command shell? So let me see if I get this straight. Help me here. Help me with the logic. Okay, we're looking at the packet. The IDS says web miscellaneous XP command shell. Okay. All right, we get down here. We can see the git request and we can see what he flagged on. XP command shell with the tick to ping. Okay. Well, that's obviously a bad thing, right? That's obviously bad. Now, if you look here, what happened? The SQL server did what? Hmm? The SQL server said, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, you can have my database password. You can have all the records in my database, but look, man, I really don't want you just running commands on me. I don't know if I'm too cool with that. So what we have to do is even though the IDS alerted on the XP command shell attempt, it failed, right? The web app, as soon as you start dealing with a modern web app, you know, most people, you know, if you're using SQL Server 2005, SQL Server 2008, XP command shell is gonna be disabled. It's not gonna let you just up and do that. So, it's frustrating. It's frustrating. So you know what we have to do. We have to ask nicely. You have to say, hey, can I please have the cookies, Daddy? That's what my kids do. I'm serious. So what we'll do is we'll go to some advanced options, and we'll reconfigure. And then what are we going to do? We'll re-enable XP command shell. Because 
we would prefer to have that. Anybody with me? I, I'd like to have that. Now, our IDS, I don't know if you've noticed, our IDS has detected us. We have been detected. Look at that. Whoa, we are blowing up the logs, lighting up like a Christmas tree, huh? Look at that. Boy, man, we caught that hacker. We got him. We got him. We got him. Now, is if he's stealing our data, we're not worried about that. But damn if he's going to execute system commands on the box. Uh-huh. I don't care, buddy. You're not going to ping traceroute, telnet, FTP. You're not doing any of that. You can have my data. That's cool. That's cool. I'm not worried about that. But I don't want you to have a shell on the box. Right? Now, here's one of the things that really kind of got me, right? Now, I work for an organization many, many moons ago when I had a job. Now, I'm telling you this because my girlfriend says I don't have a job. She's like, all you do is get up on stage and talk. You don't work. And I go, no, sweetheart, I'm a consultant. It's different. I give my opinion. That's how I get paid. Okay, it's different. I don't work anymore. But as you look at this stuff, you start to see that we as hackers love to pop a shell. Come on, who's with me? Well, there's not too many greater pleasures in the world other than popping a shell, right? Now, IDS analysts, as they're writing rules, you'll often see that that's the kind of stuff that they write rules for, right? But data exfiltration, now if you had to talk to a CIO, which do you think you would rather have given the two choices? Let's say I have an application that makes, oh, I don't know, 100 grand an hour. Would I rather you have all the data in the application or have a shell on the box? Seriously, pose this question. Which would you be more concerned about? Right, just because you have a shell on the box doesn't necessarily mean that you have access to the inner workings of the application. More than likely, if you don't, you will pretty soon, but but you're gonna notice that a lot of these products are built on certain premises. And IDSs are very much built on the premise of an attacker driving around your network. So they're looking for command execution. They're looking for command injection. You're gonna notice that's the big thing. And then they're looking for trivial vulnerabilities, really simple cross-site scripting, really simple SQL injection, not complex ones, not encoded ones, all that kind of stuff. And we're really not worried about that kind of stuff, right? Because you're gonna find that most security products look for noise. They're looking for noise. They're looking to stop the ankle biters. And that's what we have to understand when we're dealing with security products. You don't just buy a security product, you know, back the truck up, throw the thing into the rack, and kind of walk away, right? You really need competent, qualified people who understand the technology. Yes, oh my God, people. People, right? We don't want to throw millions and millions of dollars at a problem. How many of you have worked in environments where as soon as your boss watches a cool commercial, he runs into the shop like, we've got to get this thing. And you're like, no, no, we, we really don't. We've got to fix the boat mess that we have back here. And that's kind of the premise of this presentation. High security environment stuff that I've been dealing with is just spending a lot of time trying to stop, spending a lot of time trying to understand the rule set of the defensive mechanism. Once you understand the rule set of the defensive mechanism, bypassing it isn't all that hard. So let's say, for example, let's say, for example, I have a web application. And the web application is protected by a web application firewall. That would make sense, right? So dot seven should be our box with the WAF. So we open up said box with said WAF, and I try cross-site scripting. That bad boy says, danger, Will Robinson, danger. We've been blocked. Now, I'm thinking that's pretty bad. Anybody with me? That's bad. You know, you've got your, you've got your security products, but what if I were to do something like this? Whoops. Let's try, let's try this text file. It would probably help if I read my notes, right? 
I was like, no, Joe, don't read your notes. Oh, no dashes. I think he's thinking about it. What do you think? Nope. Okay. Hey, demo gods, can you help me out here? All right. Now, the demo gods are being a little mean to me right now. Let's see if we can make this work. Yay. Now, help me if I'm wrong. Would that be SQL injection against the box that's running a web application firewall? I'm thinking, yeah. Now, let's pretend that we want to start a security company. Yeah? Okay, so I want you to put on your vendor hat. Okay, you're evil now. You're the real black hat. You're putting on your vendor hat. I'm a consultant, I can talk crap about vendors. Okay, now, we want to deploy we want to build and deploy a new intrusion detection system. Yeah? Okay, so we're going to start an intrusion detection company. Snort, the open source product, has to grab a number, 100,000 intrusion detection signatures. Now, we're going to do the ethical thing and write all 100,000 competing signatures on our own. We're not going to steal any signatures from any other product because that would be unethical. Right? We're just going to sit down and write all of these. Hey, Bob, Tim, Joe, come on. Jump in there. Let's just crank out 100,000 signatures. <laughs> right? And we're going to build a scanner. We're going to build a vulnerability scanner. So Nessus, Nessus has a good 80,000 signatures and, and scripts that it checks, you know, vulnerability checks that it does. We're going to do the ethical thing and write all of them ourselves without looking at what Nessus is doing, right? So a lot of people ask me, well, hey, Joe, you know, you do all these tests against open source products like Mod Security, uh, Snort, and all this kind of stuff, you know, how close are you think they're going to be to the vendor product? And I always say, not at all. Night and day difference. Because vendors don't steal from open source security products so that they can build up their rule set. They do the ethical thing and sit down and write out all these rules themselves. Everybody? Of course they do. So. If you can make your signatures or your attack strings work against an open source security product, it's a good chance that you're, if not gonna work against the commercial product, moving in the right direction. You're gonna find that whatever concept that you use is gonna help you out. So, everybody knows I drink. Let me show you why I drink. If you've ever, 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 ever in your life had to audit source code, you drink. <laughs> Believe you me, you drink. So, we've got our favorite language, the CPP. Talk to me, people. C++, who's like, oh joy. Okay, so, now this is web night. So, when I started jumping on web night, I started looking around and I said, wow, okay. Look what they have for default excludes. Well, that's interesting. If I deploy my web application firewall, it's not gonna protect Outlook web access. Well, that's great. Now, I need you to realize that a lot of these vendors, puff, puff, give, man, it's and hand it on to the next dude. They take rules from one product and throw it right into the next product, really without doing a whole lot of research. So. When I first started deploying web application firewalls, I realized that everything about webmail is wrong. Webmail is a security violation in practice. You've got web code that literally executes system commands and queries LDAP or whatever your data store for your user database right in the web. I mean, just smack dab in front of you. On what planet does that sound like it's gonna be secure? I mean, think about it. Think about it. You know, you open up Outlook Web Access, you hit Control-K, you look up users and all this kind of stuff. You are driving Active Directory from the web, right? You're executing system commands on a Linux box if you're using Squirrel Mail or Horde or whatever it is, right? So everything about it is pulling like evals and all these types of insecure functionality. So a lot of web application firewalls exclude it. Yeah, try asking your vendor about that one. Here's one that I really liked. Check this out. Now, 
WebNight stole a lot of its rules from URL scan. Who's liking this one? Are those IP ranges that are excluded from my product? Like hard-coded IP ranges that are completely excluded from my product. Anybody like, yeah, install that on my network. That's what I want running on my network. Anybody? Yeah, that's awesome. OK. OK, well, let's, let's jump down here, and let's look at all the stuff that he doesn't want you to do. OK. 1999 called. They want their web server back. Anybody remember that stuff? Slash scripts, IS help, MSADC. Anybody remember that stuff? Come on, a couple people are like, oh, man, hacking was so fun back then, remember? Come on, come on, come on. You remember that stuff? We were killing web servers back in the day, man. It was great. Now, as we look at this, you're not allowed to do any of that MSATC, printers, samples, VTI off, VTI bin. You can't do all of that stuff. Can't go to any of those places. Can't do any of that stuff. What about commands you're not allowed to execute? No ARP, at, cackles, check disk, cipher, cmd, comp, command.com. Remember all that stuff? Right? Come on. Who's, who was like, oh, man, there's just flashbacks of the servers that you owned. Remember those days? Right? Now, here's the thing that I really think is interesting. Do you see any WMIC up there? Do you see any PowerShell up there? So if you've got a brand new app that's got functionality where it executes scripts on the local system and it's executing modern scripts because, hey, maybe I just might want to run server 2008. But I'm going to do the brilliant thing and protect it with rules that are designed to protect IIS 5 Windows 2000. Do you realize that that's what a lot of your WAFs are doing? Like, really stop and think about that. Like, next time the WAF vendor comes rolling in, why don't you ask him about that? Hey, man. Are you looking for things like bits admin? Are you looking for things like PowerShell commandlet execution? Are you checking for any of that stuff? Because, you know, we're, we've upgraded and we're using the new version of .NET. It does some of that stuff um, by default. <laughs> Might want to check for it. The next thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is logic bugs. Now, let's say Let's say I go to 2.6. So I'm going to go to 2.6. Same app without the WAF. Something that's pretty interesting is you'll notice that there's a Contact Us page, right? So when you look at the source code of the Contact Us page, I ran into this on my pen test. So I had my developers build this. So if you look at it, what do you see it's actually doing? Think about that. Think about that. Think about that. Yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. See how, see how people in the crowd were like, oh, probably shouldn't do that, huh? So I was on a pen test for a, I don't know, $40 billion bank. And I ran into something like this. So we had no SQL injection, no cross-site scripting, none of the bad stuff, right? But we basically had this. So no exaggeration. The bank tells us that they have both Qualys and WebInspect. And they have no highs. No highs. So I'm like, yeah, but you can open and read files on the file system. Like, um, you can read files on the file system. No exaggeration. The head of the security team tells me, yeah, but we found that vulnerability with one of our scanners. That's actually a low. So I was like, OK, but wait a minute. If I go dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, 
boot dot I and I, I can read <laughs> files on the file system. And he's like, no, 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 but you understand, those aren't critical files. And I'm like, okay, okay, but it's server 2008. He's like, yeah. I'm like, well, you know, server 2008 has a web.config file that's in the root directory of the web server, right? He's like, yeah. So I'm like, so what if the attacker did this? He goes, well, you can't see anything. And I'm like, well, what if I view source? I think we may have an issue. Anybody? There's a little problem here. Now, my favorite part is you won't let me execute system commands on the box, but when I stole the admin passwords for the web server and the database, enumerated all the data in the database, yanked all the stuff out of the database, and bounced like, dude, I'm out of here with all your stuff, that bad boy was like, hey, man, today's a great day. <laughs> Anybody kind of feeling that? Don't let security products become your disease. Don't let security products become your disease. Get the nerdy people. Find them. Give them Star Trek memorabilia. Encourage them to stay late. Because it's those nerdy, smelly people, the ones who don't shower with the pasty skin, they're the ones who make our networks run well. They're the ones who help us integrate security products well. How many of you could not stand the guy in the room who's like, oh, well, I'll just write a script for that. I mean, I could just, right? We've all had that guy or we've been that guy. And you need people like that to make these security products work. Security products are stupid. Let's do this one more time. Security products are stupid because they what? They suck. Come on. They suck. Security products suck. I have not seen a good security product yet. Without a good person to drive it, it's the functional equivalent of a damn screwdriver. Think about it, man. It's just a big list of rules of saying that's bad. That's all it is. So I want you guys to look at education. Look at, look at things like security tube. Look at things like the um, uh, poly edu. Right? There's plenty of free education online, opensecuritytraining.info. Look at places like that. Learn Python. Learn assembly. Right? learn web app testing stuff with all this stuff that's going on in OWASP. That's what's really going to help you defend your network. Smart people defend networks. Products don't defend networks. Go back to your job and tell your boss that we need more budget for more people. I know it's a recession. I know that. Yeah, yes, I realize that. We need more budget for more people. We need more budget for training. If we buy a product, don't disregard the training for the product because that's expensive. Hello? Why are you going to buy the product if you're not going to do training on the product? Right? I, I, I will disclose that I worked for many of vendors in my life. I even worked for ArcSight at one point. So I live that life of going out and deploying these massive products. I, I am so freaking sick of radius and network access control and all that stuff because I deployed those things. And those products suck. They suck. I went to a customer. They were doing a 802.1x deployment. So they've got uh, Mac-based off, secondary off for each port. And I go, wow, man, that's pretty bad. So I walked over. I hit the buttons on the printer. And then I got the printer test page, you know, the one with the MAC address and the IP address, all that, you know? That one. Well, the printer can't handle 802.1x, so it needs to be excluded. So when I unplugged it and changed my MAC address to the MAC address of the printer and plugged in my laptop, we have now bypassed this expensive NAC solution. Think about it. So what good did that NAC solution do for me if a person can just impersonate a printer or impersonate a VoIP phone? 
Let's kind of see the point I'm driving at, guys. Pen testing high security environments now for me is about spending time trying to understand the security product that the customer bought. Because now every bank pen test that I do, they've got HIPs, NIPs, WAFs, NACs, and a whole bunch of other acronyms that all suck. But I just keep trying to go, okay, well, what's this product trying to do and how is it trying to do it? And then as soon as you kind of figure out what's the methodology and the thought process behind how the product does its defense, circumventing it usually isn't very difficult. Okay? So my favorite one that I'll leave you with. We had um, MS1103, right, which is a browser-based exploit that does a heap spray. So literally to bypass the HIPS signature, I just didn't want to do it because time and getting this stuff to work for you guys in the demo, but literally to bypass the HIPS signature for it, in the actual vulnerability, in the actual exploit code, changing the word from heap spray to H S bypass the hips. I want you to take that with you. Guys, I'm out of here.